Good evening. Good evening again. This time amplified. Before we get started tonight, we do have a few announcements. Harvey asked if I was supposed to do that or if the song leader was going to do it, and I said, I can read, so I'll do it. Um, first of all, we have a prayer request for Harold and Sharon Springer and the Springer, Springer family. Ethel passed away on Monday evening at Willow Creek in Guthrie. Uh, the services are going to be here at the building Monday at 10 o'clock. And at the Matthews Funeral Home, there will be a viewing on Sunday from 1 to 2 in the afternoon. So we uh, need to be sure and keep them in our prayers. Also, uh, Dixie Markham had a procedure done on her back today at St. Anthony's Hospital. And Eli Huerca had uh, an MRI today to try to find out what's going on with his neck problem for sure. So we'll be waiting to hear back on that. Fern is doing mostly good, but still having a pretty rough time with some of the uh, surgery and the swelling, particularly swallowing. So they're trying to get that figured out right now. Uh, Paige Stowe had a procedure done at Integris Hospital today. She had her electrical system checked and she said she was not a fan. Uh, Robin had the same thing done and she also was not a fan. So if you had the option to have that done, maybe don't. Uh, but Robin is maybe tuning in right now, maybe not. She had a really good day yesterday and was going from morning till night. So today she's unable, uh, <laughs> but her, she's healing well. Things are going very well. She's getting some stamina back, just not quite as much as she thought, but she's doing very well. And we, we certainly appreciate all the prayers for her. Well, let's begin with the prayer this evening. Our Father, we come before you this evening and those who we've mentioned and, and many others are in need. Father, as we come before you, we, we lay all of these cares all these these worries at your feet and god we know that you care for us that you hear us and father that once we give these things to you they will be tended to we thank you for the ability to come before you in prayer we thank you for your word and we pray that tonight as we look into your word we will accept it to be implanted within us and humbly submit to your will for our lives so that we can serve you and bring glory to you. And Father, we, we thank you for, for hearing this. We thank you for caring for us. And God, we thank you for being your children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we are in Mark chapter 11. It's chapter 11, but it's certainly not bankrupt. I had to for Ben, that's the only reason. But <laughs> when you have a CPA, you have to use the, the chapter 11 joke. But it is, uh, there's a lot here, but we're gonna be covering the first 14 verses, Lord willing, tonight. And uh, so pretty easy, easy going. Who knows, we might, have even, we might even get out of here before eight tonight. Okay, probably not, but we, we could. We start out in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 11 with Jesus making his, his entry into Jerusalem. Uh, let's go ahead and read chapter 11 of Mark, verses 1 through 11. It says, As they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door inside the, the street, or outside in the street, and they untied it. Some bystanders were saying, then what are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed he who is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. The triumphal entry. You ever wondered why it was called that? I, I did. Because <laughs> it was like, well, wouldn't triumphant entry? Well, actually, triumphant is the, the procession that happens after the victory. Triumphal is having to do with the victory, so it's, he's on his way to the victory. It, it hasn't been accomplished yet, so that's the triumphal entry. Um, the location. The location is basically he's standing on the precipice. He is within a mile or two of Jerusalem. He's standing there and, and he's about to enter Jerusalem, but he's also about to enter the trials, the suffering and the death that he knows is to come. And he gives them instruction, but it's an instruction with a prophecy. He says, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. He tells them, first of all, he gives them this instruction. Go inside the city, the village. Just inside, you'll find a colt tied out. A colt of a donkey. Bring it here. How did he know it was there? See, it's an instruction, but it's also a prophecy. Because not only that, he also says, if anyone asks, because he knows someone's going to ask, he says, if anyone asks, tell them what? Who has need of it? What does he call himself? It's translated in the Greek as Lord, right? Was he speaking Greek? Was the Hebrew man speaking to the other Hebrew men speaking Greek? So what word was there? Yahweh. The covenant God of Israel. That's the, the word that is translated Lord most often. It's all through the Old Testament when you read Lord in all caps, that's always Yahweh. Or as the, the uh, Greek scholars from from Germany, worked it into Jehovah because they're wiser Jays and the Jays are wise. So it comes out Jehovah's to the Yahweh. But that is what Jesus refers to himself as. And that's important, isn't it? Has he, he's been recognized. It's been proclaimed. It's been proclaimed by the evil spirits. It's been proclaimed by his own apostles. But has he said that? Not that we have record of, but now he does. The, the time for the slowly trying to reveal and, and get them and pull them along is over, and he's openly referring to himself as the Lord. Uh, the Lordship and the deity is called into question by, by a lot of groups, but these words right here, if there was nothing else, and there's plenty else, but if there was nothing else, this would be enough, wouldn't it? So the plan is to tell them that the Lord has need of it. And what else? This is important. We'll bring it right back. 
<laughs> you know, we're, we're not stealing this animal, but the Lord has need of it, and we're going to bring it back. So that is the instruction that he gives. And, well, what happens? Verse 4, they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and then tied it. So immediately they find exactly what he said they were going to find. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing? I'm tying the colt. Exactly as Jesus had said they would. And they spoke to them just as Jesus told them, and they gave them permission. To, to us sitting here who, who've read this over and over and over and heard this, a lot of us from the time we were just little kids, right? We heard this story about Jesus going in and sending his apostles in and getting this donkey and bringing it out to him. But what if you're the apostles? It's just one more faith building exercise. It's just one more time that this person who whom you've been following and this person in whom you have invested everything, this person is one more time assuring you that he is exactly who he says he is. So they, the first thing that happens with the prophet, prophecy was fulfilled. They, they walked in and there it was. And someone questioned, just like he prophesied, and replied to him as instructed, and they let him go without a problem. I don't know. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, would you let a group of strangers come in and, and just take somebody's cult away? But then I remembered living in rural northwestern Oklahoma. And I was talking one day about how nobody ever took the keys out of their vehicles there. You go to the store, you go to the cafe, you go wherever, and everybody's keys were still in the vehicle. And I said something about that, and he said, well, yeah, if you take the keys out, somebody's liable to get mad. They might need to move it, or they might need to use it for something. <laughs> so, I mean, in a, in a community like that, it's a little different, but these were strangers. These were outsiders who came in. And so this was, this would have been something that got their attention, and it did. But they said just what Jesus told them to, and it, it worked perfectly. So in verse 7, they brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. I don't know enough about donkeys to know whether this is significant or not. But if you had a horse, a colt, that had never been sat on, and somebody sat on it, I know what happens. I've been the sitter before. <laughs> It doesn't last long. You don't get to sit there for very long. I don't know if, if a donkey would be different or not, but that, like I said, to me, that kind of stuck out. But why would he sit on a donkey on the way into Jerusalem? Was he too delicate to walk? By the way, it's about 70 miles from the Sea of Galilee, besides all the other walking. It's about 70 miles from the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem, and they've made that trek, right? And not even in a straight line. So it's not an inability. Why would they have him ride as they entered Jerusalem? There was a prophecy that had to be fulfilled. That, that would be first and foremost, I think. There's also something going on here. <laughs> There's something happening where this is the king entering. This is bigger than just a person who's been all over the place coming into another place. He's entering, well, like I said, he's, he's entering for his, for his suffering and his death, but he's, this is something significant happening. They, they put their cloaks on it. And, you know, that that's, says something because they took their cloaks off to put them on there. It wasn't like they reached into their suitcase and pulled out their extra. They, they took their cloak off and put it on this donkey for him to sit on. 
And verse 8, it says, Many spread their coats on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they cut from the fields. Two things kind of tied together, uh, and it has to do with one of the Hebrew feasts. They would bring these, these boughs, these branches, and they would bring them in, and, and at the end of the feast, the priest would be saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they would wave the branches at the priest while they were doing that. And so that may correspond to this. The timing seems a little off, but anyway. Uh, but there's that. But then there's kind of the idea of the, the gentleman putting his coat down on the, on the puddle so the lady can walk across that, that kind of idea of, uh, well, our stars walk on the red carpet, right? So their, their fancy feet don't touch the plain ground. Well, it's kind of that idea of, of what's going on here. And why do we have Palm Friday instead of Cloak Friday? I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's just the way my mind works. Because it, there were palms, there were boughs, there were branches that were laid, but also a lot, many, it says. Again, took their cloaks off and spread out on the ground for the donkey to walk across that was carrying Jesus. So if you really see this and really understand this, and before we even get to the people's reaction, this is quite a sight. It is regal, but at the same time common. The, the picture, you know, him riding and, and the cloaks and the, the branches spread on the ground is all very regal, but the animal is the common animal. And not just the common animal, but the colt, <laughs> the, the small version of, of the common animal. And then verses 9 and 10 come the praise. And I, I love this. It says, those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. And yes, I again had to look up the word Hosanna. And I was like, I know I've looked that up before. I know I've studied, but it, 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 it's a Hebrew word that basically if you just take the literal translation it means save we pray so it's a it's a prayer for salvation um in blessed is he who comes in the name of yahweh again that jehovah the, the covenant god of israel in the name doesn't signify deity though And what they're saying doesn't signify that they really understand what's going on. They're praising, they're, they're shouting out praises. But they're shouting out praises that are not quite befitting what's really happening and who he really is. Um, and, and like I said, I don't think that that's intentional and I don't think that they were... We're, we're trying to, to not give him recognition. I think they were going as high as they could. I think they were praising as high as their, their mind would let them. But the first thing is, the one who comes in the name of the Lord is by the authority of the Lord. It's not the Lord. They're not recognizing that when they say that. Uh, that goes back to Psalm 118 and verse 26. Uh, Blessed is the one who came, comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. 
Yeah. Well, and the this whole thing is a quote what their praise is. So the blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And what else did they say? What else are they blessing? Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, which is accurate. But when they said kingdom, do you think they were talking about the kingdom? Yeah. They were looking for a reestablishment of the kingship of David over Israel. They were looking for an earthly king. So again, they're, they're praising him as high as their, their imagination will even let them. But they're still, well, they're shooting low. So to me, the Hosanna, the, the save us, the one who, who co is coming to save us, is a recognition of his Messiahship. I, I, I think they, they were accepting that. I just don't think they understood all that it meant. And uh, frankly, I'm not even sure we understand all that that means. But, but I, I think that was the one that probably comes the closest. But the first two, I said they, they were shooting just a hair low. Um, but again, to, to have seen that, there's something that Mark leaves out here that I, I can't. I can't leave it alone. What was the, the call to Jesus when this was going on? What did the authorities want him to do? Shut them up. Shut them down. Make them stop. They didn't want this to happen. They didn't want him to get that recognition. When this happened, it was tearing them up inside. They were jealous already, and they were struggling and trying to figure out how to stop them already, but this was all the more. They had already been conspiring how to kill him, but they wanted to wait until after the Passover. This is Jesus taking control, and he's forcing the issue, and it's going to happen at Passover. Yeah, they, uh, he preempted their plans, I believe. I believe you're right. Yeah, because the Roman authorities, because they liked them, uh, were, were kind of letting them get away with more than, than others in a lot of other provinces. They really were. Uh, and, and they had a lot of, they were using every bit of that power that they were being allowed to, all for, for their own benefit. Um, so there, there's no mention here about the, the response of the religious leaders, nor the response of Jesus back to them. What did he say when they said, make them stop? If these don't cry out, what's going to happen? We'll raise up children from the rocks. They will raise up children for God from the rocks. Think about that. And that, of course, my mind goes back to that camp song. Ain't no rock <laughs> gonna cry out in my name. Yeah, that's that's what he's that's what he told them. They said, "Make them stop." And Jesus said, "If they stop, it's gonna get worse." <laughs> and so, like I said, I, it, there's no mention of that in Mark, but I couldn't leave that alone. I I love that that whole idea. Um, verse eleven. So Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the 12 since it was already late. So the, the triumphal entry, this, this big, huge thing of him coming into town. And then what did he do? 
You know, he looked around at everything and he just left. Um, I, one of the, the uh, commentaries I was reading said, in Mark's account, it's kind of anticlimactic. Um, but if you read this and you, you look at the way everything plays out, it does seem to be a good, uh, concise timeline of what's going on. I, I don't think that he left out. I don't think, I think it's just Mark again going into more detail maybe than some of the other gospels did. But anyway, he, he looked around town and left again. Why would he, after making it into Jerusalem, leave and go back outside, go to a suburb? What were the leaders conspiring to do? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they were conspiring as to how to kill him. And to me, it looks like he comes in, well, he has another run in with him. And then he, he looks around and he steps back out just a little bit because of timing, because everything has to happen at the right time. And if they came after him in the night, it wouldn't be time yet. So, and Judas hadn't done his deed. And anyway, so perhaps it was for, for safety or, you know, for timing, really. He, he went back outside of town. And, and we're talking about a couple of miles. We're not talking about he went back out and walked for half a day. It's, it's a couple of miles down the road to, but anyway, so as they're going, Verse 12, on the next day when they, they left Bethany, so they're heading back in, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if it, if it perhaps, if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. This is... Of course, we know that there's more to come. But when I just read this, there's this, they were coming back from Bethany. They were headed back into to Jerusalem. And Jesus was hungry. Again, it just points out the humanity. He was, he was human. He, he was God, 100%. But he was human, 100%. He's walking along and he's hungry. Well, who knows when the last time that they ate. There seemed to be a problem with them getting time and room and, and all of that to eat. But he, he was hungry. He went to a fig tree. See if there was fruit on it. Just, yeah, it died, didn't it? Um, he came back to that fig tree to look for fruit. Was it time for the fruit to be on the tree? Well, we're about to find out no. So why would he go to the fig tree when it's not time for the fruit to be there? Any ideas? Because he didn't know how fig trees worked? It wasn't even about hunger or figs, was it? So to me, I, I look at this and, and again, after reading several commentators and different scholars on this, there, there were a lot of different opinions, but if we just take it on its face, it's hungry. He saw a fig tree and he went to see if maybe there was a fig on it, but there wasn't. It was, it was leaved out, but there were no figs on it. And Verse 14, he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples were listening. I said that he, he cursed the tree. Well, yeah, okay. He was within the earshot of the 12. So again, it's going to turn into that teachable moment. Is it a, a lesson on timing? Because, you know, the fruit bearing was was going on and or the fruit bearing wasn't going on, but he was expecting something. 
Um, what is it about? Is it about timing? Is it about cursing? What's this lesson about? Well, we actually get to that because he points it out. But all too many times I hear people take something like this and rather than go to the explanation, they start making their own explanation and making their own application. Often misapplication. Uh, the only point given is God's power. The only lesson given is God's power. So that's the only one we're gonna we're gonna do. We're not gonna add, we're not gonna take away. This is in the context, and we're gonna, Lord willing, cover this next week. But this is in the context of Jesus cleansing the temple. Jesus turning violent in the court of the temple. You can say what you want. I've heard a lot of people talk about this in a lot of different ways and soften it up in a lot of ways. He was throwing things over. He made a whip out of cords and he drove the people out. If that's not violent, I don't know what is. It was absolutely justified. He was absolutely right and righteous in what he did but it was a violent act. It doesn't quite fit with the narrative of the Jesus who will let you do anything and never call you on your sin. So a lot of people try to downplay it. But we're going to look at it as it is and we're going to take it as it is. But this cursed fig tree is sitting exactly half on one side of that and half on the other. <clears throat> The, the initial action is on this side, then will come the cleansing of the temple, and then the lesson is on the other side. So it has a tie-in with the cleansing of the temple. Isn't this a moment where the master, the creator of all things, has the ability to say these things, and we understand today whether they did or not, the power he has because he is who he is. The master can say, no one's going to eat of this again. And that's what I recognize even before I get to the, the lesson that he's going to teach you. You have power that comes from the Father. And I'm showing you that. But the master says it. And that's how I recognize it. Absolutely. But you have homework. And your homework is to read this, read this section, read this chapter, read the book. Um, it's not a bad book to read. Um, but look at this acted out parable, if you will. This lesson taught through the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple and put it all in the context and put it all together. And just kind of think about how that's interconnected. And like I said, that'll be your homework, and we'll talk about that next week. So what lessons do we have from the first half of chapter 11? The words of the Lord are truth. When he says, there will be a donkey, there will be a donkey. And when he says, just say this, just say that. If we can walk by faith and submit enough to just listen to what he says, believe what he says, and do what he says to do. As much as it worked out for these apostles, it'll work for us too. Living prophecy was proven so that we could have faith in our resurrection. See, this was all leading up to his resurrection. But without his resurrection, we would have no hope. God is worthy of all honor and praise. It's either us or the rocks. He'll raise up someone to praise him. And we need to be careful of the lessons drawn from his word. We, I know these are old sayings, but y'all, they, they hold just as true now as they ever did. We need to speak where the Bible speaks. We need to be silent where the Bible is silent. And it's always best to call Bible things by Bible words. See, I remember hearing this when I was growing up and 
like all too many things, it kind of went in one ear and out the other. But when you see what some folks do with the word, it, it's good advice. It's very, very sound approach to the scripture, and we need to use that. Thank you all.